Welcome, everyone. This is Robin Duncan, and I am here with my husband, Terry Macy. Hello, everyone. Great to be with you. This is our A Course in Miracles Global Study Group, and tonight we will be covering Chapter 16, Section 2, on the power of holiness. Let's begin with our opening prayer. Take in a nice, relaxing breath. Dear God, we come to you today, and whatever it is that we are carrying on our shoulders, whatever might be troubling our mind, we wholly give to you. And we ask for our faith to be restored. Help us to understand what it is we see. Help us to stand strong in our faith. Help us to reach higher into the holiness in our own mind in oneness with yours where we are forever safe. Dear God, we lift up to you that you would raise us up and help us to feel your love, your power, clarity, and wisdom around us at all times. Help us to accept those things that are going on around us without fear, to trust that your plan is perfect, and that even when we do not understand which is most of the time, that your plan is still perfect. There is something about what is happening right now that is leading us to higher levels of happiness and being awake. Dear God, we ask for your strength today to help us to forgive ourselves for anything we feel that we did to bring us to where we are, the part that is still troubling our mind, and help us to forgive those that seem to have contributed to anything that feels less than happy or peaceful. Help us to see the light in them, to acknowledge the Holy Spirit within them. Some days it is easier than others. Yet you have our commitment. As we pray each day, you know our intention is pure. And when we forget, help us to forgive ourselves as you have forgiven us and to accept only what is true into our holy mind. Your will be done through us. Amen. All right, here tonight we have our Chapter 16, Section 2, on the power of holiness. One thing I found rather reassuring in this section is that miracles do not require our understanding. The ego likes to speak first and loudest. It likes to decide. It likes to judge. It likes to form the plan. And miracles do not make sense to the ego. If you have a significant illness right now, the ego does not understand how that could be instantaneously healed. If you have trouble financially right now or you have something happening in the future that you fear, the ego does not understand how this could be corrected right now. And so thank goodness, Miracles do not require our understanding. He's reminding us again and again that the healing is not up to us. And remember that all healing is of the mind. And the Holy Spirit is healing our mind. And as our mind is healed, we open our eyes to see the effects of that healing. And while we are still asleep and dreaming then that dream is going to look much, much better. Our part is the invitation to allow Holy Spirit to guide us. Our part is to not decide against the healing, 
Sometimes when things have been going on so long or they seem complex or too difficult to solve, we cannot fathom how God could even fix it. And we lose hope and we displace our faith. The Course teaches us that we always have faith But we must ask ourselves, where are we placing our faith? Are we placing it in the illusion, believing that the problem is much greater than the cure? Or are we placing our faith in our inner guide and his capacity to make all things right? And you might look over your own shoulder and ask yourself, where am I placing my faith? in the healing and the divine mind that is orchestrating that healing? Am I trusting? Am I offering my faith? Am I standing in his certainty? Or am I spending my thoughts in the direction of what I do not want? And hopefully each one of us can get better and better every day at refusing to send our thoughts in the direction of what we do not want. Our part is not to use the situation to reinforce what is not real. Our part is to not decide against the healing. It sounds like we have lots to do, but really it's a lot to not do (laughs) when you think of it. Our part is to not assign an order of difficulty to our problem because if we decide that our problem is just too big or it's been going on too long or it seems to be tied to that person over there and they are impossible to deal with, we might just decide that we are beyond hope, that we are outside of the realm of healing. And the moment we decide this, Holy Spirit must wait to offer the correction until we change our mind. We have the power of holiness. It is the Holy Spirit's function to accomplish the healing, to provide the correction. I like to think of things in images, as you know. So if we were all walking west and we've learned that walking east is a better choice, that it would bring us much more happiness, let's say. And Holy Spirit is the guide to help us to walk in that direction. The Holy Spirit must wait to guide us in that direction until we are completely done with walking west. You cannot be 90% done walking west because there would still be 10% of your mind that would be invested in walking in that direction. And if Holy Spirit was to tug on you to get you to walk in the other direction, even for your own good, this would be an attack. And so we must be wholly invested in allowing the divine plan, understanding that we do not know what it is, asking for the divine plan, knowing that we do not know the direction, holding a willingness to trust our perfect guide when we may not ever have done this before. And sometimes you might ask yourself, well, why would I be willing to do that? Trust something I cannot see, ask for help from someone I do not know, and be willing to give up everything that I've invested in in order to walk in a direction into some place that I cannot understand. But when I really ask myself deeply, what I come up with is that I already know what's in that direction. I have walked in that direction for a very long time, and it has been inconsistent at best. A Course in Miracles is teaching us that if it is inconsistent, It's not the truth. If it is inconsistent, it's not love. If it is inconsistent, then we are following the voice of our own ego and we are not following the voice of the Holy Spirit. 
And once we hear these things enough through our daily practice, we say, what the heck? How about if I just try letting Holy Spirit guide me today? And I tell you that each time I have done this, and I know Terry feels the same, every time we turn something over to the Holy Spirit and we have no other answer that we would substitute, it always turns out better than anything we could have thought up ourselves. Always. And each time this occurs, there's a building of faith that happens. Trust is developed. It is experiential. If we do not know the Holy Spirit, why would we ask for help? Why would we allow this part of our mind that we cannot see to guide us? Why would we even think that it is there? It is through experience. Sometimes I sit back and there are no words to explain how loved I feel. Because answers come so directly. Sometimes this does not happen at first because we are very committed to our own story. We believe that life is unfair. We believe that other people are part of the problem. So we see darkness in many pockets of places. And so our own experience of miracles and healing can be spotty or inconsistent. But the more we practice, the miracles become a daily occurrence where they are natural and we come to embrace that what God has given us is nothing short of perfect love without fear, that there is a divine presence within us that knows what we face, that understands, that has compassion and will speak to us in a language that we understand. If I spoke French, it would speak in French. If I was a toddler, it would speak in words that I could understand. Today we are embracing the holiness within each one of us, recognizing that whatever it is we are facing, there is no limit on the healing that is possible The Holy Spirit is saying to us, I have the unlimited power of God to help you. And I'm right here. I'm ready to help. But sometimes I cannot give you that help because you have more faith in the story you see, the one that you made up, instead of faith in me. Which means that you are not yet done with the illusion that you're looking at, you're still dissecting it, you're still judging it, you're still afraid of it. And that's okay. You can be afraid of it, but come to me for comfort. Come to me for everything. And I will lead you, and you will be free. But you must give me your whole mind, your whole attention. And I know we can do this because... As Terry and I practice with so many of you, you can feel that your peace is increasing. You can feel that your fear, your temptation to judge others is decreasing. And that curve will continue. So imagine one day when you wake up without the need to reject or judge anyone or anything. And imagine waking up on that same day as you recognize there is nothing to judge because without the need for judgment to reinforce what is not true, there would be nothing to solve. There would be no one holding up the illusion. We join together, God. We are so glad to claim what is rightfully and eternally ours. You created us in perfect creation. You offered us perfect love, which we still have today. We have never lost it, and there is no mistake we have ever made that can keep it from us. We celebrate today the power of holiness within us that you placed there, and you have our commitment that we will 
place our attention on you and far less on the illusion and even less still on the voice of pain being the ego. You have our attention. We want the truth instead of this. We want to be awake. We want to know the greatness of God's love. We want to experience the happiness that is his will for us. And we will not stop until that is wholly accomplished in our mind and heart. All right, Terry, why don't you kick us off here tonight with a a little laughter to get us started. All right. Well, my laughter today is called The Innocence of Children. So two young boys walked into a pharmacy one day and walked up and down a few aisles, which caught the eye of a pharmacist. The boys finally stopped in one aisle, smiled at each other, slapped a high five, then picked out a box of something from a shelf and proceeded to the checkout counter. Well, the pharmacist at the counter now saw that they picked out a box of tampons. (laughs) He asked the older boy, Son, how old are you? Eight the boy replied. The pharmacist continued, Do you know what these are used for? The boy replied, Not exactly, but they aren't for me. They're for him. He's my brother. He's four. Oh, really? The pharmacist replied with a grin. Yes, the boy said. We saw on TV that if you use these, you would be able to swim, play tennis, ride a bike, and even climb a tree. And right now, he can't do none of that stuff. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, it makes me laugh. <laughs> oh gosh, kids are so funny when they're sweet, they sweet innocent. <laughs> Just trying to help his brother out. That's all we're That's trying right. to do, right? Help our brothers out, <laughs> and they help us. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> all right. Let's go ahead with chapter sixteen, section two on the power of holiness, paragraph number one. You may still think that holiness is impossible to understand because you cannot see how it can be extended to include everyone, and you have been told that it must include everyone to be holy. We have learned that separation is not real, and as we look out into the world, we might see many dark places maybe even dark people, those that would do evil deeds, things that we cannot even comprehend. And you might think holiness is impossible if it's supposed to include everyone. You might think it'll be a 1,000 or 2,000 or 5,000 years before those that are not acting with love would choose to do so. But remember that this is not something that's being fixed. It is something that is not true in the first place that is being undone. It might take six months to build a house, maybe a year, if it is a large home, and yet with a wrecking ball, you could take it down in a few hours. When something is on its way out, it can happen much more quickly. And as we are thinking about the thoughts that created the world that we see, the Holy Spirit is busy at work right now healing our mind and we are offering him our attention and as our mind is healed, our projections will reflect that healing until we come to that time and place where we can wake up. He tells us that you cannot fully awaken until you are happy for a while because your awakening is so happy that we must practice so that we are ready. We are being prepared for that awakening. So in every day and every way, as much as you know how, practice being happy, practice offering loving, gentle, happy thoughts to others. Practice your happiness. And know that this holiness does include everyone. They are not being fixed. They are being seen truly through the eyes of love. And this 
shows us a much different picture. Sentence 3. Concern yourself not with the extension of holiness, for the nature of miracles you do not understand, nor do you do them. It is their extension, far beyond the limits you perceive, that demonstrates you do not do them. I thought these two sentences were interesting here about how we do not understand miracles, nor do we do them. So keep in mind that it is not up to you to resolve your problem as you see it. Be very clear that it is the Holy Spirit's function to accomplish the healing. And as that healing is given you through the healing of your mind, you will see that healing reflected in your life and it will naturally extend to everyone because we are one. And so this healing that's happening in your mind is going to go out in all directions from your mind, literally blanketing the world as you see it in the light that you behold. Sentence 6. Why should you worry how the miracle extends to all the sonship when you do not understand the miracle itself? One attribute is no more difficult to understand than is the whole. If miracles are at all, their attributes would have to be miraculous, being part of them. You may not be worrying about the miracle or how it extends to everyone, but sometimes we do worry about whether miracles are possible at all, whether it's something going on for you or someone that is in the hospital that just had a serious accident, we might be worrying that the miracle is not available to them or to us. So before we decide against them, remember that's one of our parts, is to not decide against the Holy Spirit and to make room in your mind for the miracle to be received. Simply borrowing the certainty of Holy Spirit and allowing that place in your mind to be filled with the blessings that you have already been given. Paragraph number two. There is a tendency to fragment and then to be concerned about the truth of just a little part of the whole. And this is but a way of avoiding or looking away from the whole to what you think you might be better able to understand. For this is but another way in which you would still try to keep understanding to yourself. Let's say that all of a sudden you stopped getting your mail. You know, something that can be puzzling. You don't understand. It's not showing up. You might have a little mailbox there at your place and you haven't gotten mail in days and you're thinking there's something wrong with this and you've contacted the post office and you've talked to the mail delivery person and you're just puzzled, like what's going on and You might find that you're thinking about it all day long, just this whole idea that you're not receiving your mail as you should. And so it says there is this tendency to fragment, to be concerned about the truth of just a little part of the whole. And this is just one example. But our mind is so clever at getting us to focus on just one little error and possibly one giant error but to not see the whole at large. So whenever there is a problem that seems to be taunting you to give it attention, be sure to include the whole error. Thank you, God, as I give this to you, that I cannot be without something that is mine, something that is rightfully mine, even my mail if I'm asleep, right? Nothing can be denied me. And perhaps this situation is showing me that the world is inconsistent, that it is unreliable, perhaps unsafe, maybe deceptive. Perhaps I have this idea that someone is stealing my mail. You see that even through my mail, I might be able to identify many different beliefs that are supporting this whole experience. And it's not that we have to go through and do this giant inventory but to understand that we are looking at an illusion. And our part is to not validate it, not reinforce it, 
to ask for the truth instead of this, but to ask for the truth in the place of all illusions. Don't forget to include all illusions, for it's not just this one that we are concerned with. We would like the end to sickness, scarcity, memory loss, cancer, everything that is troubling to any of us today. So no matter what it is that you are challenged with, As you are asking for help, asking for the truth, be sure to ask for the end to all illusions as you recognize that you are looking at your own false images in the place of the truth and we are asking for the truth instead of all illusions. Sentence four. A better and far more helpful way to think of miracles is this. You do not understand them, either in part or in whole. Yet they have been done through you. Therefore your understanding cannot be necessary, yet it is still impossible to accomplish what you do not understand. And so there must be something in you that does understand. I put a little smiley face there that, thank goodness, (laughs) there is something in us that does understand, right? So... As you are challenged with something, you can simply say to yourself, I call to the something within me that does understand, that does have this answer, that will tell me what to do, and that has no fear of any kind. As you wake up in the middle of the night and maybe you're thinking about something that is worrying you, I love to remember that the Holy Spirit is not worried. The Holy Spirit has no fear. The Holy Spirit has every answer, even when I do not understand. And so we can pause and we can surrender the problem, turning it over to the something within us that does understand and loves us completely and will provide the answer. And now we place our faith in this something, a willingness to trust that we have asked and we will be answered. Paragraph 3. To you, the miracle cannot seem natural, because what you have done to hurt your mind has made it so unnatural that it does not remember what is natural to it. And when you are told what is natural, you cannot understand it. He's reminding us that the world we see, the one that we made through our own misperceptions by accepting that false idea of separation, now we are looking at a world that seems to be separated in every conceivable place. So the world we see has become very familiar to us. And so things that are quite natural, like God's blessings and gifts and being answered and having the solution instantly provided to us because it is not the will of God that we are challenged. So the things that are natural to us seem unnatural, and the things that are so unnatural, like pain and suffering and scarcity and despair and loneliness and sickness and death, all of that, that has become natural to us. And he's saying that we are very quick to question God, but we are not so quick to question this illusion that we have made. And he would like us to switch that around. Question the illusion. Refuse the illusion. Turn it over to the Holy Spirit. This is natural. And allow Holy Spirit to help you. This is natural. But place your faith in him. This is natural. And you will have the result that is natural and happy. Sentence 3. The recognition of the part as whole and of the whole in every part is perfectly natural, for it is the way God thinks, and what is natural to him is natural to you. Holy natural perception would show you instantly that order of difficulty in miracles is quite impossible, for it involves a contradiction of what miracles mean. And if you could understand their meaning, their attributes could hardly cause you perplexity. Let's take a moment to think of a situation that is troubling to you. 
Perhaps it is a lifelong situation or something more recent, but something indeed that feels really hard to solve. And remind yourself that God did not create this situation. There's a line in the Course that I love. It says, God wills I be saved from this. God wills I be saved from this. And let's declare together right now that we ask for the miracle in the place of the problem. We receive the correction in the place of the challenge. Holy Spirit, we call to you the something that is within us that does know the answer and is guiding us and will make sure we are successful. We are calling to you today to be our guide. We wholly give you this situation. We are willing to see it differently in every way. We forgive ourselves for anything we feel we did to contribute to it. And we forgive those that have contributed to it also in our mind. We forgive everyone. We leave a clean and holy place in our mind to receive the miracle. We are willing to place our faith in you. We are willing to trust that you know the way and that you will not drop us. You will not leave us at the curb. That your way is perfect and you are leading us back to what we are entitled to, God's great blessings, his perfect love, and happiness without a trace of sorrow, perfect health, freedom from lack of any kind, safety from every disaster. Holy Spirit, we want the truth, and we are willing to stand up to our illusions, We refuse them together. You have our commitment. We will step back and let you lead the way. And we will trust that there is no order of difficulty in miracles. And we are willing to experience the unlimited power of God in helping us. Amen. Paragraph number four. You have done miracles, but it is quite apparent that you have not done them alone. You have succeeded whenever you have reached another mind and joined with it. This is such a true statement, and they all are, but this one reaches out to me because the times I've experienced miracles, it seems to be always in those moments where we are reaching out for one another and we are joining in our faith. And we are willing to see things differently. And we have had those miracles. And he's telling us that the miracles happen through us. And it always comes when we are reaching into another mind and joining with it. And we learn even through the Bible that when two minds join as one, God is surely present. So I thought this next line, number three, is a great reinforcement of what happens when two minds join as one because the ego is undone. Sentence three. When two minds join as one and share one idea equally, the first link in the awareness of the sonship as one has been made. The Course also reminds us that whoever is saner at the time can do this. It doesn't take two awakened minds to invite the miracle. It's just one person that is willing to take a stand for the truth. Even when we're not aware of it, remember the miracle is not up to us and in truth we don't even understand how it occurs. And he says that's fine. It's not up to you. You do not need to understand. You must invite it and you must be willing to receive it and know you are worthy of it. Simply be willing to do these things and then the Holy Spirit can accomplish the healing through you as you join with the other mind. Sentence 4. When you have made this joining as the Holy Spirit bids you and have offered it to him to use as he sees fit, 
His natural perception of your gift enables him to understand it and you to use his understanding on your behalf. I love taking these statements and trying to turn them into I statements. Sometime I'd love to just do a whole book of A Course in Miracles and I statements or first person. So we could say, I have made this joining as the Holy Spirit has asked me to, and I am offering it to him to use as he sees fit, allowing his natural perception of my gift, enabling him to understand and to use it through his understanding on my behalf. It brings it home. It helps us to understand that whatever we offer to him through willingness, he's going to turn right around and use our gift on our behalf to accommodate the healing. And that is such an act of love. It's selfless love. Every time you turn a burden over to him, this is a gift to him to take this burden from you and heal it for you. But remember to place your faith there. Once you turn a problem over, you do not want to keep spinning through the problem in your mind. Be willing to turn your faith towards him as well. Be willing to trust his perfect response, his confidence, his clarity, his strength, until we have our own. Sentence 5. It is impossible to convince you of the reality of what has clearly been accomplished through your willingness while you believe that you must understand it or else it is not real. He's saying there that willingness is enough. So many people think that that's just not enough, that we have to understand what's going on. We have to have a plan. We have to follow that plan. Am I listening to Holy Spirit or am I listening to the ego? What is it I'm doing? What if I'm doing it wrong? I'm clearly not worthy of God's answer or his blessings because I might be doing it wrong. What if I'm not meditating enough? What if I'm not taking the right steps? What if I don't understand that illusions are not real? He said it can clearly be accomplished through your willingness, but we can lay down these other parts. We do not need to understand it. We must be willing to understand it is not real. Paragraph 5. How can faith and reality be yours while you are bent on making it unreal? And are you really safer in maintaining the reality of illusions than you would be in joyously accepting truth for what it is and giving thanks for it? A couple of points there. I thought it was really interesting that he used the word bent, (laughs) that you are bent on making it unreal. That's kind of a slang term, I think. And I just love that he speaks in a language that we understand. How can faith and reality be yours while you are bent on making it unreal? So that might be a word we used maybe when I was a teenager more. I love you, Holy Spirit, for always using those words that get our attention. And he's asking us, are we really safer in trying to maintain our illusions that we are running out of money or that this sickness cannot be healed or that our illusions will never allow us to be free? Are we safer in those thought forms than we would be in joyously accepting the truth for what it is and giving thanks for it? Asking for something and being grateful that you already have it are two completely different thought forms, and they are opposed. So every time we ask for money or health or love or well-being, it's not that we're doing something wrong, but we're asking for something that we have already been given. And really what we could ask for instead is the awareness to understand that we already have what we believe we need and give thanks that it is so. And in our prayers, we can say, Dear God, instead of asking you for the money that I need by Tuesday, I'm willing to understand that you gave me everything already, and I'm here to be grateful for it, and I'm here to give you my faith, place my attention on the Holy Spirit, let the Holy Spirit heal my mind, and heal up all those places in my mind 
where I thought there was a gap. I am learning that you did not create a gap. You did not withhold anything from me. You are not delaying anything for me. I am here in gratitude that none of my illusions of scarcity or sickness or being unfairly treated by life are real. I am refusing my own illusions. Holy Spirit, please decide for me about this. I want the truth instead of this. And I am grateful, dear God, that what you created is perfect. What you gave me is unlimited. And I stand in recognition of what you have given in humbleness and gratitude. Amen. Sentence 3. Honor the truth that has been given you, and be glad you do not understand it. That's pretty cute. So instead of feeling bad that we do not understand or we might be doing it wrong, he says, be glad that you do not understand. (laughs) I love how he just takes the ego's ways and just wraps it around in a circle and says, don't worry about that. Be glad that you don't understand and just honor the truth that has been given you and you will be doing just fine. Sentence four. Miracles are natural to the one who speaks for God. For his task is to translate the miracle into the knowledge which it represents and which is hidden to you. Let his understanding of the miracle be enough for you and do not turn away from all the witnesses that he has given you to his reality. Those couple of sentences there, four through six, again, these are beautiful statements to reassure you when you're feeling a little unsteady. And he's asking us to let other people witness to us what God has given. There are some people that have never experienced a miracle, and that's okay. Time will come. And there are some people that think it's not possible. But there are those like Terry and I and so many of you that have experienced miracles, amazing miracles, and maybe there's only been once or maybe a hundred times, maybe 500, but for those that have experienced it, instead of feeling sad for yourself that you haven't had one yet, be glad. He says, do not turn away from these witnesses that God has given you that miracles are possible and they are yours to have, that God's love is here and now and always. And if there is any person that can witness this to you, listen and embrace it for yourself. Be glad that someone has had a miracle so that you know you are right there ready to go. You are ready for your miracle. So don't use these experiences to Prove to yourself that it's possible for everyone else, not me. We are one, and as our mind is healing, you're going to have your own miracles. I've never seen it fail. And so be open. Place your faith in the one who knows the answers, the Holy Spirit, and be willing to be patient and ask for those miracles and expect them. (laughs) Our mind is so busy turning away from them, rejecting them, resisting them, and deciding on something else and being preoccupied with something else that sometimes the miracle must wait because it would clash with where our mind is occupied. Paragraph 6. No evidence will convince you of the truth of what you do not want, yet your relationship with him is real. Regard this not with fear, but with rejoicing. Just think of that, that your relationship with God is real. And he's asking you to not be afraid of this, to rejoice that it is so. And you may not feel it, or maybe you do a little or a lot, but it is real, and it's yours. And knowing that you have the unlimited power of God, the creator of all in all, on your side, to say the least, is something to be really happy about. Know that this relationship is real, whether you are aware of it or not. The way to become aware of it 
is you must first invite it, welcome it, and expect it. It is yours to have. But this part of our mind is pure love, and love will never intrude on your mind, will never control it. So we can step back and make room to be aware of our one true relationship with God and all the blessings that have already been given. So there is much for us to behold and so much to be happy about. And we can start practicing today if we haven't already. Sentence four. The one you called upon is with you. Bid him welcome and honor the witnesses who bring you the glad tidings he has come. That's a beautiful quote. Just the one you called upon is with you. Even in the middle of the night when you're feeling alone or overwhelmed and your mind is on spin cycle, the one you called is with you. Bid him welcome. Honor the witnesses who bring you the glad tidings that he has come. Be willing to trust it. We have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Sentence 6. It is true, just as you fear, that to acknowledge him is to deny all that you think you know. But what you think you know was never true. What gain is there to you in clinging to it and denying the evidence for truth? For you have come too near to truth to renounce it now, and you will yield to its compelling attraction. That might sound a little scary to think that in order to acknowledge him, we must deny all that we think we know. That sounds very absolute, and for some it might seem too much to ask. But imagine right now that you're asleep and that you're dreaming, and the dream that you're dreaming, it has many good parts and then some very scary parts and parts that you worry a lot about. What he's really saying to you is you are asleep and dreaming right now, and you've made up this whole dream that is very complex, and it's got you convinced that this is reality, and it's not any different than your nighttime dreams. And he's saying, if you're willing, I can wake you up. When you wake up, all the darkness in your dream will be undone. Every part of it will be undone. And when you wake up, there will be only gain. There is nothing that you love that would be gone. That everything you love is what is with you forever. And so as you wake up, Even though he's saying that to acknowledge him, you must deny all you think you know, remember this, that with God there is only gain. There is no loss. And the only thing you would lose are those parts that you have miscreated that are painful, scary, lacking. And so today we are willing to understand that we want to be awake that it brings only blessings with it. We would not lose a thing. We would gain everything at the loss of nothingness. Sentence 10. You can delay this now, but only a little while. The host of God has called to you, and you have heard. Never again will you be wholly willing not to listen. Amen. (laughs) So these sentences are so reassuring. We can all just jump up and down and party here. It says, we can delay this, but only a little while, because God has called to us, and we have heard. Yay, high five, everybody. We have heard. And never again will we be wholly willing not to listen. So he's telling us, everybody, that we did what he's asking us to do. And this is a very good thing. And there are so many good things headed our way. So never again will we be wholly willing not to listen. So lots of reassurance here. And the next paragraph brings it on home. Paragraph 7. This is a year of joy in which your listening will increase and peace will grow with its increase. 
The power of holiness and the weakness of attack are both being brought into your awareness, and this has been accomplished in a mind firmly convinced that holiness is weakness and attack is power. Should not this be a sufficient miracle to teach you that your teacher is not of you? So you could say that every one of us has already had at least one miracle. Because if you're here listening and you are practicing at some level, you used to believe that attack is power, that if someone was being mean to you or attacking you in some way that you should stand up for yourself, attack back or muster up your strength and use it against them and that being holy, maybe that's being weak and maybe it's a nice thing to do but it doesn't really do anything. So he says these are things that our mind was firmly convinced about and isn't it a miracle that we're already at a place of understanding that weakness of attack and the power of holiness are both being brought into our awareness. So we are learning that attack is weak, it's not power, and that holiness is strength. So in fact, a miracle has already occurred in our mind because we are learning the power of our own holiness. And he's saying that shouldn't this be proof that the miracle is here to teach you that your teacher is not of you because If we were the ones to come up with these miracles, we would never get out of our own line of thinking. So there is something within us, something, capital S, that does know the answer, that is leading the way, that will make sure that we are successful and is worthy of our trust and our faith. Sentence 5. But remember also that whenever you listened to his interpretation, the results have brought you joy. This is true, that every time I've really turned something over, especially when I was completely out of answers and I did not know what to do, he has never failed me to answer what to do, how to move forward, what needs to happen, and then somehow, some way, there is a peaceful and most of the times a joyful answer. Sentence 6. Well, I was also just going to share with you that, in fact, the part about results have brought you joy. Uh Uh-huh. Of all the miracles I've ever experienced, and I know all the miracles you've ever experienced, the outcome was never disappointing, never sad, never wrong, never Never. why that. It was always joyful and perfect. Always, yeah. And, in fact, anyone ever involved with or associated with any of the miracles also won. There was never a miracle that cost anybody anything. Exactly. It's so true. So this part of our mind that is orchestrating this whole awakening process loves us completely and those corrections along the way are so filled with love and you feel it more and more every day as your mind is being healed real time. You've pointed out so many times, the course is all about everyone winning. No one loses. Everything is to be a win-win scenario. And it's always been that way in miracles. You know, even as a kid, I just learned the practice of even sitting at an exam and praying and asking for guidance about how to take the test and allowing all the information to come to me easily because I am one with divine intelligence, divine wisdom. And I would also take a moment to ask that same prayer for everyone in the class because I understood even as a young person that you can't just have a miracle by yourself, that it has to be for everyone or you're really not asking Mm. for anything at all. And it worked. I never got less than an A, so... (laughs) I give total credit to Holy Spirit, who is brilliant. (laughs) There's times I think I should have gotten less than an A, but somehow it worked out. Holy Spirit is a perfect teacher. Sentence six. Would you prefer the results of your interpretation, considering honestly what they have been? God wills you better. Could you not look with greater charity on whom God loves, with perfect love. 
So let's say you have this idea that you might be running out of money. Two months, six months, two years, eight years, God wills you better. Let's say you have an illness that seems incurable. God wills you better. Let's say you feel alone and you'd love to have companionship and you're feeling sad and without hope. God wills you better. We must learn that our Creator loves us. I think so many times that we don't expect to be helped or answered. We do think we are alone. And this idea is blocking the help that is so eagerly provided. God wills us better. Paragraph 8. I was just going to say, too, that in terms of if, if one were asking for a miracle to get someone, I want you to get that guy over there, then you're asking the wrong people. Right. <laughs> you're making the wrong request, and you're looking for the wrong outcome. And if Holy Spirit, I could see him saying, you know, don't come crying to me with that. That's not my job. <laughs> I'm not in that business. Yeah, I'm not in the business of you're waxing people. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, my okay. department, whack-a-mole, is only a game. <laughs> That's right. Paragraph number eight. Do not interpret against God's love, for you have many witnesses that speak of it so clearly that only the blind and deaf could fail to see and hear them. There are so many messages of love and so many messengers. In fact, every one of us is a messenger And whoever chooses to be in that role is one. So everyone listening, you are a messenger of love. Even in the middle of the night, if you just need something to do, you can go over to my YouTube channel and listen to a few of those videos at A Course in Miracles for Living with Robin Duncan or just put in my name and find some free videos there. Or um, other ones that I really love listening to are people that have gone to heaven and back and near-death experiences. It's just so beautiful what they experience, and they always have messages of love. It's wonderful when people go to heaven and back, and the reports are generally the same, a little different based on who's telling it, but it's mostly the same, and it just gives you such reassurance that only love is waiting for you. Sentence two. This year, determine not to deny what has been given you by God. Awake and share it, for that is the only reason he has called to you. Well, let's just do that right now. We are determined not to deny what has been given us by God. So, dear God, we stand together, everyone listening right now, to receive your blessings exactly as they have been given We have learned that you have given us everything with nothing missing, that your love is perfect, that you created us in perfect creation, eternal spirit. You created us to be free and happy and blessed. And we are awake, and we are here to share it. And this is the reason that you have called to us, and we are answering yes. We are your holy, precious child, yes. We receive your blessings. Yes, we are here to share those blessings, and we stand in excitement together and gratitude as our mind is healed by the Holy Spirit, and we ask for the vision to see what is true. We want the truth in the place of all illusions. We refuse our own old story. We lay down our judgments, and we stand ready to receive the love of our Creator and to know it experientially. Amen. Sentence 4. His voice has spoken clearly, and yet you have so little faith in what you heard, because you have preferred to place still greater faith in the disaster you have made. Today, let us resolve together to accept the joyful tidings that disaster is not real, and that reality is not disaster. Reality is safe and sure, and wholly kind to everyone and everything. 
There is no greater love than to accept this and be glad, for love asks only that you be happy and will give you everything that makes for happiness. I love these paragraphs. They're so sweet and reassuring. It makes me think of a quick little miracle story that some of you might have heard, but a friend of mine, she was walking through a Trader Joe's store and she had her little cart and she wasn't looking at a certain direction and she actually nudged one of the end caps of this stack of wine bottles and it was stacked way high up and her cart hit it and she said all the bottles started tumbling down and she had just come from one of the classes in my home and we were talking about illusions and how illusions are not real And she was just in this state of shock as she's watching all these bottles come tumbling to the ground. And she just shouted out for herself, illusions are not real. And not one of the bottles broke. Even the store manager was amazed, like, how could none of them have broken? Bottles are so easily broken, it seems, in our illusion. Even just six inches above the ground, if you were to drop them, there it goes. So all of a sudden, this entire end cap of bottles came tumbling down. But as the dreamer, and she's the dreamer of the dream, if she can take a moment to deny the illusion power by saying illusions are not real, that means that she is opening her mind to what is real, which means there is no damage. And what he's telling us here is his voice has spoken clearly. But we've had little faith because we have been placing our faith in disasters that we have made. But he's saying that we can resolve together to accept the joyful tidings that disaster is not real and reality is not disaster. So I love that she remembered to do that quickly and then there were no negative effects from her illusion. And if you forget to do this, as we all do, then it's okay, but do it as soon as you think of it. Even if you see a big hurricane that went over an island and there's all this destruction, remind yourself that illusions are not real. Storms are not real. And I know you'll feel like you're a little bit crazy when you say these things, but if you are the dreamer of the dream, and so are we, and if the dreamer has no use for these illusions and for this damage and destruction and we are going to disempower that thought form then we can make room for power where it is so when we declare that this is not real it doesn't mean that we will not help with the recovery for the islands or what needs to happen this is our defense against it happening again because if the dreamer has no value for the illusion it has to stop illusions are not real that's the truth we see them because we believe they are real so it's okay to just practice throughout the day on anything you see that is disturbing your peace of mind illusions are not real this blank is not real that blank is not real I want the truth instead of this and you might think you're just talking to thin air But what you're actually doing is you are inviting the Holy Spirit to join you right where you are to heal your mind, to correct the problem, and to keep you from disaster of any kind. So let's place our faith in what is true, practice every day, and you're going to see things shift outside of you. And our final paragraph tonight is number nine. You have never given any problem to the Holy Spirit he has not solved for you, nor will you ever do so. You have never tried to solve anything yourself and been successful. Is it not time you brought these facts together and made sense of them? Now remember, it doesn't mean that we are inept or inadequate or dumb. It means that we have fear in our mind. And when we have fear in our mind, we have somewhat of a fog around our mind. And so we would not be the right person to solve the problem because we are not looking at anything clearly when we are looking through the eyes of fear. 
but we do have something within us that does know the answer, that is clear, and that is not afraid. So we can bring those facts together and make sense of them, turning every problem over to the Holy Spirit, which means that it is not up to us to solve it, which means that we are not even asked to understand the answer. We are just asked to invite the Holy Spirit and let happiness be given us. Sentence four. This is the year for the application of the ideas that have been given you. For the ideas are mighty forces to be used and not held idly by. They have already proved their power sufficiently for you to place your faith in them and not in their denial. I love that, that this is the year for the application of the ideas that have been given us. And these ideas yeah. are mighty forces. <laughs> so let's yeah. use those ideas, practice them, play with them, let them be your natural friend, and you're going to see your life heal. It's going to continue. It will get lighter, lighter, lighter. Now, as your mind is thinking about things that are destructive, like pain, sickness, illness, loneliness, betrayal, life being unfair, you might experience some level of inconsistency in results because your mind is split. It's inviting what is true, but it is still entertaining what is false. And that's part of the practice. This is what awakening looks like. You're not doing it wrong. You're practicing. And just like a child that's learning to walk, they probably fall down a thousand times, and they get back up, and pretty soon they don't fall down anymore. So it's okay. Be patient with yourself. Appreciate how far you have come and give love back to yourself for every moment that you have offered to the Holy Spirit on your behalf because he says every time we do this, he can extend that blessing to everyone. And you are doing great work out there, everyone. Thank you for every effort you are making to remember what is true, to stand up to what is false, and together we are going to experience our freedom. Now let's go to sentence 7 to the end. This year, invest in truth and let it work in peace. Have faith in him who has faith in you. Think what you have really seen and heard and recognize it. Can you be alone with witnesses like these? No, we can't be alone. And today we are going to allow ourselves to invest in the truth. We are here to invest in what is real, to let it work in peace, and we are going to try to give 24 hours at a minimum to not deciding against our own miracle. Everyone here, be willing to trust that God is love, trust that you have been heard, trust that there is something within you that has an answer, trust that you are safe, Trust that Holy Spirit is the one to accomplish the healing and ensure your success. So we have to back off and not decide against ourselves, not decide against our own healing, not decide against the miracle, and be willing to know that we are wholly worthy of receiving God's blessings. And in truth, they've already been given this makes this process much easier. And today, dear God, we thank you for strength, for steadying our feet, for helping us to restore our faith in you, to abandon our faith in our own ego, and to refuse illusions at every level. We want the thoughts that you have given. Our mind thinks only those thoughts we think with God. We're willing to see everything outside of us as filled with the love, the light, and the wisdom of God. And if we're not seeing truly, we ask for the vision to see. We want the truth in the place of all illusions. Amen. Terry, can you finish us up with one of your Q&As? I sure can, but I just want to remind you, Robin, that if you apply 
today's lesson, you will be able to swim, play tennis, ride a bike, and even climb a tree. <laughs> <laughs> I will keep that in mind. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, here is my closing Q&A. The question, are some of my limiting beliefs too deeply embedded in my mind to be corrected? And the answer comes from the text, chapter 25, section 7, paragraph 12.5. All insane beliefs can be corrected. The Holy Spirit can use all that you give to him for your salvation, but he cannot use what you withhold, for he cannot take from you without your willingness. For if he did, you would believe he wrested it from you against your will. And so you would not learn it is your will to be without it. You need not give it to him wholly willingly, for if you could, you had no need of him. But this he needs, that you prefer he take it than that you keep it for yourself alone and recognize that what brings loss to no one you would not know. This much is necessary to add to the idea no one can lose for you to gain. So I guess if we practice this idea that let's say you have a fear about something and it's really been present in your mind and sometimes keeping you awake at night, He's simply asking that we prefer that he take this from us, this problem and the fear that surrounds it, that he take it from us and that we would prefer that he take it than we would keep it for ourselves. And it seems like that would be an easy thing to do, but we are so used to being in worry and fear when something doesn't look right to us and we are wishing for a better situation that that preoccupation is blocking the answer from being given. So let him take the problem and the fear as well. Be willing to give yourself a break from it. Be willing to open your mind, just seeing a nice, quiet, open space in your mind and asking the Holy Spirit to enter, to intervene on your behalf, to take this from you and judge it for you and that you're willing to not use it against yourself. Instead, you are asking him to use it for the coming of your peace. It's okay to be afraid, but we can still turn over all the conditions that have brought our fear about. And if you need to write them down and put them in a little God prayer box, that's a great idea because it reminds you that you wrote them down and you turned them over. And if the fear starts to come up again, turn them over again. So we thank you, God, for your perfect love and that the Holy Spirit is eager to respond to our slightest invitation. And we thank you through this section for so much reassurance tonight that we don't need to understand the miracles and that we can still have them. They can still be done through us because there is something within us that does understand and there is less and less for us to know and to do that we are in very good hands and we have nothing to fear. That the Holy Spirit is waking us up. This is the awakening journey. Sometimes we toggle a little bit and we forgive ourselves for that. This is what waking up looks like. We are learning to abandon our illusions and not reinforce them and to place our attention on our teacher of peace and to listen to only one voice. And we get better at this every day. And God wills that we would have something even better than this. So we accept all that we have been given. We are worthy. We are blessed. And we are grateful. Amen. <laughs>